Welcome to the Real Estate Edition of That Business Show 2.0. I am your host, Jamie Maloney, where each Thursday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, real estate becomes show business on this uh, weekday uh, show, That Business Show. New episodes again air weekdays on thatbusinessnetwork.com as you're finding us uh, for the first time on a podcasting platform or if you're finding us online. This show is over three uh, years old now and caters to the uh, business professionals. Each and every morning we talk with different business professionals. And on Thursday we talk about my business, which is real estate. Been in business over 10 years with a Coldwell Banker and would like to help you in your buying and selling of real estate. Uh, if you're in the Tampa Bay region, I can help you uh, specifically. If you're outside of the area listening to me in another uh, state, we do have a vast relocation and referral network that can help you. So please reach out to me, thathomevaluation.com. Learn more about my real estate business also at jamiemaloney.com. I want to talk about an incident I had uh, this past week. I uh, specialized in the sale of bank-owned properties and had a, an asset that was assigned to me. And uh, a lot of times you'll hear uh, Sario brokers refer to houses as assets. They are under control of an asset management company. And uh, just through the general lingo of the business, uh, we call them assets. Every industry has its lingo and, and real estate is uh, no different. And within real estate, you have the REO business, which stands for real estate owned, which is an acronym that is used in place of foreclosures. So if you hear me say the term REO, that's what I'm talking about. REO derives from uh, uh, bank uh, lingo years ago when they used to distinguish between the the assets that they owned versus the assets that they mortgaged. Uh, when they owned them, they had foreclosed on them and they've taken ownership. So they would say that is real estate that we own versus real estate that they mortgage, which is what they prefer. They do not prefer to own assets. They prefer to mortgage assets. But speaking of owning assets, an issue arose uh, this past week with one of the ones uh, that uh, the VA owned, and I am a, a listing agent for the uh, the VA. The VA contract is uh, controlled through VRM, Vendor Resource Manager. They're based out of uh, Texas, and uh, also if you're in the uh, business, uh, the announcement just came out that uh, VRM has been awarded the VA contract for the next 10 years. The VA contract is a government contract like many, many, many other uh, government contracts out there that companies can bid on and they ha in this situation, it's they handle the disposition of the uh, foreclosures when a veteran who makes a loan uh, under a, a guarantee from the, the VA defaults and has to be uh, foreclosed upon, that asset then rolls over to vendor resource manager and they uh, hire their agents locally. Similar process with HUD. You've heard me talk about HUD. Right now, HUD contract is controlled by Sage Acquisitions LLC, and, uh, and that contract comes around every five years. In the case uh, with the VA, uh, it apparently comes around every 10 years. I think uh, it actually comes around every five years, but for whatever reason, I think VRM has done such an excellent job uh, with their commitment to, uh, to quality and, and technology. They have an, uh, an amazing uh, uh, platform uh, that they use to manage the disposition of the real estate assets that is second to none in my opinion. It's, it's something they have built from the ground up uh, internally. Uh, it's went through many bugs and issues uh, through the years as they work out all the different uh, uh, kinks with the uh, system, but it's really a, uh, for asset management, I think it's much better than a lot of the standard platforms uh, that we uh, use in the business, such as Equator, such as uh, Res.net, such as Pyramid, and the other uh, platforms uh, that are out there, including the, uh, the in-house platforms that some of the uh, banks use. But again, VRM has been awarded the uh, VA contract for the next 10 years, so that's good news for people already being assigned listings uh, through VRM. Uh, but if you would like to uh, get uh, listings uh, with uh, VRM, you would have to go to their website and uh, fill out uh, their application as you do with any uh, uh, bank, uh, um, uh, bank client out there. And I'll talk about how to get in with banks on a, another show. It's one of those secret things in the business that REO brokers don't like to talk about. But I'll give us uh, some tips and tricks on the uh, business uh, in the coming up episode. Speaking, though, of what happened uh, this past week, though, I was assigned a, a new property. First step in the uh, assignment of an asset is to go check the occupancy of the uh, property. So I go by the property. Property's vacant. Even the door was even unlocked. So I was able to walk inside, walk through the property completely vacant. It's exactly what REO brokers like. They don't want to have to deal with the occupants. Uh, they don't want to have to deal with anybody uh, residing in the property. Sometimes the former owner stays behind. Sometimes uh, the property is rented. Sometimes it has a squatter inside of it. It can be a, a few different situations. And I've had 
many different situations and how you deal with them uh, you know varies from person to person so we proceeded with uh, the marketing or the pre-marketing stage of the property which is you know clean up the property do any repairs uh, health and safety uh, wise that are needed and then uh, get the property ready for sale so between a seven and ten day window between the time I first checked occupancy of the property to the time that it was then cleaned by the general contractor and then the day after the contractor uh, did the cleaning they give a task to the broker to go over there and check the quality of the work to make sure that uh, the cleaning and the, the debris removal in the yard was all cut to, to standards and that you signed off on it. So the contractor had uh, cleaned the property and I went over to uh, inspect the property and now it's occupied. <laughs> and so my first thought is, okay, am I at the wrong house? Second thought is that I have the wrong house to be in with. Of course, I've never made uh, that mistake except on a couple of condos uh, uh, one time, which I've shared the story of that before, but it, it's, it's difficult to make that mistake on a home in, in Florida. They're all lay, lined out nice and neatly along, uh, along a street with the house numbers, uh, very uh, difficult to get that wrong, as opposed to places like in, if you've been to Puerto Rico where you go down the street, you don't even know what street you're on. And I've talked with uh, REO brokers that are in Puerto Rico, and a lot of times they have to find their houses by asking neighbors where this house is, and they hear this old family story about the, about them and then their family, and then they're down there past Joe's house, past the broken down blue car on the left, past that oak tree, and uh, it, the addressing system in Puerto Rico is uh, nowhere near what it should be versus what we have here in the United States, especially in Florida. But that checked out. And so a uh, teenager answered the door and I asked him, when did you move in here? And he said, it's been a couple of weeks. I said, well, I don't think it's been a couple of weeks. I was just here five days ago and the home is vacant. And so I said, is your parents home? And he said, no. And he gave me his uh, phone number for his parents. So I contacted his uh, uh, mother and uh, she called me back and I, I told her the situation and I asked her, where did you find the property? And she said it was for rent on Craigslist. And I started to ask that initially. I said, did you find this home for uh, rent on Craigslist? And, but she volunteered that information. And right away, I, I knew that it was, a, it was a rental scam. And so this is something that you need to be cognizant of as a renter in the uh, Tampa Bay marketplace, especially. I've dealt with this over uh, two dozen times at least, and that's just me personally. Other uh, brokers have dealt with this uh, countless times and other just property owners in general I have dealt with this issue, but a rental scam is a very easy uh, scam to run. It's simply a person finds a vacant home, they break in through uh, you know the locks, or a lot of times a window is unlocked or a slot, especially the sliding glass doors in Florida. Those things are, are terrible for security of a property. There's there's sliding glass doors. You can usually shake those things and then open those things up. So if you have a sliding glass door, you might want to invest in some additional security. That's just uh, you know an aside. Uh, from the story uh, tip, put something in the slider along the bottom so that that door cannot slide open. But I have gotten into so many properties uh, through those sliding glass doors uh, when a property is assigned to me and I know that the property is vacant, but uh, criminals can get into them as well. And they go inside the property, they change the locks, and now they have the key to the property. They look like the owner of the property. They put it up for rent in Craigslist. They'll ask a cheap price so it goes quickly and uh, doesn't attract a whole lot of attention. And they'll ask for like a first month's uh, in deposit, a couple thousand dollars out of your pocket, a typical uh, move-in cost for a property. And they'll take the money. And a lot of times you won't see them again. Uh, you'll move into the property. They'll give you the keys to the property. And then somebody will eventually knock on your door. In this situation, we knocked on the door in a matter of uh, a, a couple of days from when they had moved in. It was literally the contractor completed the um, the cleaning on a Thursday. I was assigned the task on a Friday. I didn't go until Monday. They had moved in over the uh, weekend because uh, the prior, uh, not necessarily the prior owner, but somebody had rented them the property erroneously. And so now they're out. I think she said she gave them $2,500. I told them, you know, go through the due diligence, contact them, let them know that you were contacted by me. Of course, they don't respond. They told her they weren't available and out of the country until the end of the month. I told her to report it to law enforcement, and it was obvious the property was foreclosed. There was a big notice that I posted on the front door that somebody would have taken down that said this property is now owned by the VA and for instructions on anybody residing in the property, please contact me. And of course, whoever rented the property to this family took that down. 
and now this family is uh, is stuck inside this property without reserves uh, to move, and they're scared. They don't know what to do. And so from our standpoint, fortunately, they're dealing with a bank who has, you know, policies and procedures in place versus maybe a, a landlord uh, who, you know, somebody just moved into the property and they just want them out of there. They could have filed an eviction for a few hundred dollars and get, get them evicted. And in Florida, an eviction carries through within about a two to week, uh, two to three week time frame. Fortunately for them, uh, more than likely, the client will offer them cash or keys, relocation assistance, uh, but it's a unique situation in the sense that they moved in after the property was already declared um, uh, vacant and uh, repossessed and taken control of by the VA. But regardless, they do have heart and they don't want to see somebody put out onto the street and so they'll offer them some type of uh, relocation assistance in the event that they you know, don't you know, uh, accept relocation assistance, the alternative is uh, an eviction. But that rarely carries through all the way uh, to the end with somebody still residing in a property uh, in an evicted uh, situation. And I've had that uh, happen uh, several times, more than several, and I've talked about some of those situations here. But the key takeaway to this whole story is if you're renting a property, don't look on Craigslist for don't Don't do anything on Craigslist. Craigslist is full of scams and a lot of dangerous situations and criminals are uh, stalking uh, cr uh, Craigslist. But you want to do your due diligence. Make sure that the person who's renting the property is the verified owner or representative of the property. Go through uh, legitimate property management companies that have relationships with the owners. And all this can be done through simple uh, Google searches and public records to verify who the owner is. Got a little bit more on this uh, topic when we come back from the break. I also want to talk about another common issue uh, that arises in our area called adverse possession, where people take possession of the property, uh, property thinking they have actual legal rights to take uh, control of the property from the bank based on an old 18th century law. So you're listening to that business show 2.0 the real estate edition with your host jamie maloney where real estate becomes show business hi welcome to yeagers we just want to take a minute and show you what we're all about uh, at yeagers our primary business is hardwood flooring although we are remodelers for kitchen bath and general construction we operate a fleet of shop at home vans that have all the flooring type products hardwood flooring laminate flooring tiles stone what have you so we're able to come out first with products in our vehicles and take a look at the setting, how the colors will work, and then to be able to come up with some options and ideas for you. If that's not good enough, we have a large distribution center that we inventory product and have a nice display area.
Welcome back to the Real Estate Edition of That Business Show 2.0 with your host, Jamie Maloney, where real estate becomes show business Thursdays, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with new episodes on thatbusinessnetwork.com. In that last segment there, I was talking about a recent situation whereby somebody had moved into the property as a a result of a a rental scam. And again, these things are all over uh, Craigslist. They pop up uh, and they they, they come down, they're put up for rent, and then they're taken down. And and really, there's not a whole lot that uh, the general public uh, or the real estate agents or the property owners can do other than put notices up at the home that the property is under control of uh, so-and-so. If if you've been um, you know, asked to rent this property, please report this to, you know, so-and-so, but that's all well and good, but the, uh, the scammers can, you know, easily get inside the property and take down those notices. So that is one line of defense that REO brokers will use. Like I said, I had a notice up on the front door in this situation and have it up on the inside of the uh, glass window, but that was because, uh, this property was already, um, uh, set for cleaning. And a lot of times when we put those notices up, the contractors uh, take those down. So I like to put those up after the uh, contractors have cleaned the property to avoid uh, losing them in the uh, in the uh, the cleaning process. Uh, but regardless, uh, you know, uh, Craigslist, easy to put things up uh, for rent. And bank properties are a, you know, a sitting ducks for these uh, types of situations. They learn who the properties, uh, who the REO brokers are. So they watch uh, their inventory, or they'll watch their sites. They watch uh, public records and county auctions to see which properties are coming through on the docket that are vacant. And they just drive through neighborhoods and look for uh, foreclosed properties or, or not necessarily foreclosed properties, but just vacant properties in general. And it's quite easy to find vacant properties. Uh, they're usually overgrown, uh, some type of uh, disrepair or deferred maintenance, and they stand out like sore thrums in subdivisions that have community standards. And then they go in there, they break the locks, and they move somebody in. And again, this has happened to me at least a, uh, a couple of dozen times. This is the first time it's happened to me after we had already taken possession of the property where somebody moved in in between the, the tasks uh, that we were creating, meaning people that were going in and out of the property. They, they hit that window just perfectly uh, where either myself or uh, my contractor or my Reiki vendors uh, didn't come to the property and catch them moving into the property or catch them with the uh, person who had rented the property uh, to them. And so now they're in the property and they'll be offered some type of a relocation assistance. Of course, though, that really doesn't do them whole uh, a lot of good. That makes, you know, resets them back to where they were, but now they've got to move out to all over again. They, the idea is of will the bank, you know, continue renting the property or will the bank sell the property uh, to the uh, people? They're not going to rent the property back to uh, the individuals. The banks are not in the business to be landlords. I've never seen a bank ever rent a uh, property in my uh, in my portfolio. I'm sure it's happened at some point uh, along the along the line, but they're not in the business to be landlords, and so they're not going to rent the property uh, to uh, people. To sell the property uh, to them, that's a, is a possibility. But anytime an occupant inside a bank of property wants to buy the property, nine times out of 10, they'll make them move out of the property and then submit an offer after the property becomes vacated for obvious reasons that somebody could submit an offer living in the property and now they have control of the property. They could delay the closing. They could be denied the financing. All kinds of different things could happen to complicate the uh, process. And so the uh, bank client would just as soon have somebody move out of the property who wants to submit an offer on the property and then submit an offer. I know it doesn't make sense for somebody who's in that property and who is a good person who has the funds available or or has the credit available and who's going to purchase the uh, property. And I get this question a lot. And I've only had one situation out of 1,600 sales and of those probably 40 to 50 percent of them had been occupied at some point uh, that where somebody said that we want to buy this property and we don't want to move out of it first where the bank said okay we'll do that and they actually closed the transaction all the other times that that question has been proposed to me the uh, bank said yeah they can submit an offer they need to move out and we need to put it on the multiple listing servers and then they can submit an offer that is usually the standard uh, procedure for submitting offers on a property when somebody is living in the property. I want to talk about another situation, uh, though, that arises is adverse possession. This is an interesting uh, law that goes back to 18th, 19th century. I think it's an old English law. Don't don't quote me on some of those historical facts, uh, but essentially 
um, adverse possession is it's an actual law that says that somebody can take possession of a property if the property is abandoned by the uh, owners of the uh, property. And what it was designed for was uh, abandoned farmlands, abandoned uh, property where people had you know vacated and were no longer tending to the land, and the neighboring land people would come in and then begin to use the property. Uh, for farming and, and, and they would pay the property taxes on the property and then maintain the overall decor of the uh, property. And so it was a good thing because the person wasn't coming back and it also required that the person possessing the property be in control of the property and maintaining the property, which also means paying the property tax bills for at least seven years. But through the years, that law got twisted into people's own interpretations of what the adverse possession uh, law stated. And now we've got people moving into properties that are vacated, claiming adverse possession. And there is no, uh, there is no precedent and there is no case law on any uh, of this. I don't know where it necessarily arose from or what uh, group or person started this. There was a, a company in the news a few years ago here in Tampa, I think it was called Homes for Americans, who had set up a legitimate company under this adverse possession um, law, were attracting and recruiting tenants and putting them in properties and giving them this bogus paperwork that said, you have legal rights to be here based on these, these adverse possession claims. And then they were thrown out of the property. Of course, they came back to the Homes for Americans uh, uh, company, and that person was arrested. And I think he got thrown in jail. I'm not, I'm not sure what uh, became of that person. But that person actually tried to set up a legitimate company around this. A lot of people aren't that dumb to set up an actual company and put yourself out there like, hey, this is what I do. They do it behind the scenes through situations like Craigslist where they'll try to recruit somebody under this. Or a lot of times they just do this themselves. This is not a situation oftentimes where there's necessarily a middleman. You, this is more of a situation where somebody says, hey, I read about this adverse possession situation. You know, there's that home down the street. Let's go ahead and move into it. We'll create this, this site here that gave us some paperwork to, to file with the county. We'll fill this stuff out. We'll send it in. We're going to claim that we have legal rights to the property under adverse possession. And then if it's a bank owned property, uh, eventually the bank gets around the foreclosing on it, or maybe it's already listed, an agent stops by, and it, and it creates a, a complete uh, civil uh, situation. Anytime you have somebody in a property in Florida, you can't just tell them to leave. Even if somebody breaks into your property and moves in, and you call the cops and you say, hey, this person has moved in, all that person has to say is, hey, we had an agreement to move in here, then uh, you know, I'm renting the property. You know, and we had a verbal agreement. And of course, it becomes his word against your word. And then the cop will tell you, well, it's a civil matter. You're going to have to file an eviction against uh, this individual. And so it just complicates the uh, situation. You can't have them physically uh, removed. The only time you can have them maybe physically removed is if you got a, a, a squad or somebody who's moved in, not necessarily moved into the property, but somebody who's broken into in, uh, the property and maybe it's not of, of much intelligence or much, you know, doesn't have many, uh, has too many marbles rolling around up in their head and they don't have any sense about themselves and they've broken into the house and they've been living in one of the bedrooms and they can tell they're not actually living there. They haven't turned on any utilities. They're just looking for a roof over their heads. Cops will uh, ask them to move out of the properties. Even agents, uh, I've ran into uh, several through my career and you just, you tell them to leave a lot of times they will leave. But when you run into the more sophisticated uh, people that you know understand how the system works, then they can uh, create a situation for you that takes uh, several weeks to even several years to get moved out of the uh, property. I've got a particular property uh, right now, a very nice home up in uh, Carrollwood that uh, over 5,000 square feet had become the uh, victim of an adverse uh, possession claim and has been sitting vacant, I mean, I'm sorry, sitting occupied with them for over two years before we finally got them out of the property. And on the day of the eviction, it was still a tense situation because the person did not move out of the property. They still claimed legal rights to be there. And then when the, the head of the household came racing home after the, uh, the daughter in the home said, you know, there's police here trying to throw us out, came racing home and had all these, this paperwork to show the cops and myself, which was completely bogus and was even, you know, thrown out of court by the, uh, the uh, foreclosing judge, it, it still created a tense situation. And we finally got them out of the property. They had moved into, again, a 5,000 square foot home in Carrollwood, And they ended up living there for about two years 
before finally uh, being asked uh, to leave. But again, adverse possession is an old, again, 18th, 19th century law that is designed for people to take possession of a property, maintain the property, pay the public, uh, or say, pay the property taxes on the property, and then treat it as if it's become their own property for at least seven years. That's the key difference between what people are trying to do today versus what the law was actually intended to do. And I guarantee you the people today aren't paying the property taxes on the property. Their sole claim is that they are maintaining the property and keeping it up to standards in the neighborhood and so they should have legal rights to the property free and clear of all encumbrances on uh, said property. But it doesn't work that way. If somebody presents you with an opportunity to move into a property under adverse possession, run. <laughs> and again, this is it's not a valid law. And I've never seen a situation uh, in my entire real estate career where somebody has legally taken possession uh, of a property through adverse possession. I'm sure it's happened in recent years in other parts of the country. Uh, but this law is not a, a modern day law and so the, the, the standards and practices of our culture really do not uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, go in line with what this law was intended to do at uh, the time uh, of its uh, implementation. So again, run from uh, uh, anything that says adverse possession. Stay off of Craigslist when it comes uh, to any type of rental situations. Go through reputable uh, property management and real estate companies. Check public records for who the uh, owner of a record is and ask for identification on people who are renting the property uh, to you. And then uh, above, uh, you know, and as a last tip of a piece of advice, get a lawyer involved. Ask for a lawyer to review all this stuff. They're going to have uh, insight and information into uh, property uh, management uh, that you may not know, even maybe I might not know uh, to uh, check. So again, always seek out the assistance of legal help. So again, you're listening to the Real Estate Edition of That Business Show. We air new episodes each Thursday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on That Business Network through our video stream. End of the week, we put it up on iTunes and up on YouTube for review, and it's available on demand also in the real estate section of thatbusinessnetwork.com. You've been listening again to the Real Estate Edition of That Business Show 2.0 with your host, Jamie Maloney, where real estate becomes show business. Hi, welcome to Yeagers. We just want to take a minute and show you what we're all about. Uh, at Yeagers, our primary business is hardwood flooring, although we are remodelers for kitchen, bath, and general construction. We operate a fleet of shop-at-home vans that have all the flooring-type products, hardwood flooring, laminate flooring, tiles, stone, what have you. So we're able to come out first with products in our vehicles and take a look at the setting, how the colors will work, and then to be able to come up with some options and ideas for you. If that's not good enough, we have a large distribution center that we inventory product and have a nice display area.
Welcome back to the Real Estate Edition of That Business Show 2.0 with your host, Jamie Maloney, where real estate becomes show business. In this segment, I want to talk about uh, third-party uh, sites uh, that are across the uh, multiple listing uh, service that cater to uh, the consumer in uh, the uh, industry of real estate, specifically Zillow. Uh, Zillow's in the news a lot as a, uh, a competitor slash friend slash foe of uh, the real estate agent and of the consumer. What made Zillow, first off, uh, so popular is the use of the Zestimate. It's a trendy little uh, tool that you can go and look up the uh, price, or not say the price, the value of, the, of a particular property anywhere across the uh, country through their automated valuation feature. And I, I'm attracted to it myself. I think it's a nice little uh, thing and something that years ago, uh, even before Zillow came out, that I had an idea you know, with all these automated, you know, uh, valuation features in stocks and bonds and, and finance, because I had come up through uh, college with a, a finance degree, I wondered, could we ever automate the valuation of real estate? Would that be possible? But valuing real estate is such a, you know, tricky uh, subject. There is no two pieces of property that are 100% identical. There's no way for an automated valuation feature to know the interior condition of the uh, property or, you know, the history of the property <laughs> or what the neighbors may or may not be doing, you know, beside the uh, property. All of those things can input uh, or can affect negatively or positively the uh, value of the property over and beyond the norms uh, for that particular neighborhood. And then Zillow came out with uh, the Zestimate. And I can remember starting in real estate in 2007. And there, a lot of people at that time were investing in real estate. The market was starting to go south, but some people hadn't gotten the word yet. And investors were putting in offers. And I can remember a lot of people, when they would submit the offers and we would talk to other agents, they would say, what is the Zillow on the property? And they were making their offers based on the Zestimate. So in 2007, uh, 2006, 2007, people were actually re relying on the Zestimate in our market to make offers on properties. Today, the Zestimate on properties in our market is usually 10% high uh, at a minimum. Uh, it, it's rarely right. I do a lot of uh, property evaluations. And so the first thing I look at is I go uh, and I look at the uh, Zillow and then I do my broker price opinion or the CMA comparative market analysis, whatever you want to call it, and then compare it against the uh, Zillow value. It's almost always about 10% underneath what the, the uh, Zillow uh, estimate says. So if you're a homeowner out there relying on the Zillow estimate today, it's a lot of times wishful thinking. Sometimes you can hit that mark just depends on the uniqueness of the uh, property. But if it's a conforming home, uh, it's hard pressed uh, to get anything of much above and beyond what the other homes in the neighborhood are going with. That comes down to standards and conformities and overall appraisal uh, best standards practices that you know rely upon you know comparative data to value your property. I know you have properties that are in unique situations, unique marketplaces, million dollar and up neighborhoods inside you know LA, Chicago, New York. That's a completely different marketplace as I've uh, you know, mentioned many times on this program, but you know, the, for the typical home in Florida, a lot of these homes are inside subdivisions. They all look exactly the same. They should be priced fairly, to, fairly uh, similar based on a price per square foot uh, for the neighborhood inside of these conforming uh, subdivisions. Coming back though uh, to Zillow and what I was saying about uh, this. So they, they produced this automated valuation feature, but it's strictly an algorithm based on whatever inputs. I don't really know what goes into their their inputs. I don't even think it's a matter of uh, public record, but uh, it's it's not right. And they even have a standing uh, challenge out there for the community or for any developers um, who can improve the algorithm and make this estimate uh, more reliable, more accurate, I should say. I think it's a million dollar prize for anybody that can produce the algorithm that makes the Zestimate much more uh, competitive and in line with uh, the, the, the actual values of the property. So there's a challenge out there for uh, developers uh, who uh, want to uh, produce something uh, you know, in the automated valuation market. But again, going back to what I was saying in uh, college that I had often wondered, is there a way to value real estate uh, without input of uh, you know, an individual through an appraiser? I don't really think there is. You can get in ballpark estimates and ballpark estimates are about you know, 10 to 15% uh, within, within that range. 
but you're never going to be able to produce uh, something as accurate as an appraisal. Today, though, a lot of lenders are starting to use their own desktop valuations to value properties, and we're going to start to see a trend away from appraisers as more and more lenders rely on desktop valuation features. They have their own automated valuation features. But again, just you know, in line with that whole automated valuation discussion, I don't think you'll ever get away from really accurately valuing a property unless you have an actual appraiser go to the property, inspect the property, and then produce its uh, you know value. Coming back to Zillow and how it interacts with uh, the community. First off, Zillow is a it's a third party site. It's not directly connected to the National Association of Realtors. A lot of people say when you put the property inside the uh, multiple listing service, it goes out to all the other sites. It goes out to Realtor.com, to Trulia, to Zillow, and, and Trulia and Zillow now uh, are one of the same. Zillow picked up Trulia, but kept uh, Trulia's brand because of its own uh, unique little features uh, in, that it has on their uh, on their on their site. And so, but Zillow, um, uh, you know, is it doesn't get its information through the multiple listing service. It gets its money or it gets its um, listings through uh, a service called ListHub. And so, all the uh, real estate agents or all the real estate brokers submit their information on their properties through ListHub, and then ListHub then sends it out or disseminates the information to these other sites, to Zillow, to Trulia, to Homes.com, and all the other five, six, seven hundred plus different uh, websites that are out there that have this information. So Zillow doesn't always get all the information from different real estate brokers. All the large brokers out there, the Keller Williams, the Cole Bankers, uh, the Century 21s, they are going to have connections through ListHub because they want to maximize uh, value for their, their clients. They want to maximize value uh, or an exposure for their listings. So they want to get it on every single possible site they can. And a lot of people think that Zillow is trying to eliminate the real estate agent. They're trying to come in and take the real estate agent out of the picture. And so why are real estate agents then supporting this service when they don't have to? Well, one, because the consumers demand it. They like Zillow, and if you list a property and it's not on Zillow, you're probably going to get a complaint from uh, the, the homeowner. But the nuclear option that people could uh, enlist is simply not submit the, the information to, uh, to Zillow and your small brokerages may not have a connection through ListHub and when they put the property in the multiple listing service, it may not go out to uh, Zillow, it may not go out to Truly, it may only go to Realtor.com. And that brings me back around to the one main thing I want to people to understand is Realtor.com is owned by the National Association of Realtors. It is connected directly to all the multiple listing services. And so that is the one site above all others that if you want accurate, real, as close to real time information as possible, you want to use Realtor.com. All Realtors have access to the multiple listing service. Multiple listing services in residential real estate are regional. Uh, and in our situation, we're part of the Greater Tampa Association of Realtors. And when we put properties in our multiple listing service, we can see about seven counties. There's some reciprocity between some of the other counties uh, with Pinellas Realtor Organization. And then we got the Hernando County uh, Real Estate uh, Board, which has its own uh, multiple listing service. And there's not any reciprocity when we put something in a multiple listing service that it appears up there. But all of those uh, kind of sites are connected to Realtor.com. And so as a consumer, though, you want to be looking on that site. If you're on Zillow looking, then you're going to miss some information. You're going to see information that is outdated. You're going to see properties for sale that are not for sale anymore. You're going to see properties that are marked pending that are back on the market. And so Zillow is not good information uh, for real time uh, property uh, uh, price and availability. That's where you want to use Realtor.com. And circling back around to the multiple listing service, realtors are going to look strictly in the multiple listing service. They're not going to go to Zillow and Truly and all those sites to look uh, for the properties, but consumers do. Consumers don't have access to the multiple listing service, which is a vast a database of, of properties uh, that are inputted with all kinds of information that's easily searchable and then disseminated out to the uh, public uh, through a few different channels. I can remember uh, coming into real estate in 2006 and somebody was talking about, okay, we need to get you access uh, to the 
multiple listing service and I was confused because some sites out there was like, you know, hey, you have access to the multiple listing service through our site. I didn't understand it. It was a whole separate uh, uh, database controlled by the, uh, the realtor associations and looked much different than what you would get on. At that time, Zip Realty was the uh, site that claimed to have access to the uh, multiple listing service and was a, a pioneer in the industry of of uh, real estate uh, listing uh, and sales information. That's actually the company that I started in. But uh, regardless, uh, Zillow is not on the forefront of real-time property information. Zillow is in the business of statistics and information and just giving you all these bells and whistles and adjustment to attract your attention. They, they get all these leads and they sell them back to the realtors and based upon um, you know, the zip codes uh, that the realtor want to le wants the leads in, the price points, the, the type of home, whether it's a listing, whether it's a, a sales lead. And, but at the end of the day, there's a divide between real estate agents who love Zillow and real estate agents who hate Zillow. The ones who love it are essentially getting the leads from Zillow at a cost. Zillow doesn't give anything uh, unnecessarily away for free. But then there's the other half of the realtors uh, who say that Zillow is looking to wipe out the, the real estate agent take control of the uh, real estate uh, industry and the multiple listing service and become the sole source of information uh, in, the, um, in the real estate business. Regardless, it's never a good idea to uh, you know, rely upon any one source of uh, uh, business as your sole source of business are realtors who strictly get their leads from uh, Zillow. And I read an interesting uh, story this uh, past week about a person uh, who had tons of reviews on Zillow, tons of business coming through Zillow, but uh, they thought he was using a uh, virtual private network to uh, basically generate his reviews and his engagement with his clients. And they kicked him off of, um, off of Zillow completely and suspended him from the platform for one year, all because they blamed him for using a virtual private network and creating fake reviews on the site and using the site uh, against their terms of uh, service. So again, not and really nothing you can do about it. Uh, he uses Zillow according to uh, you know their terms of uh, of service and according to them, he violated those, although he says he didn't. So, but again, you want to make sure that you uh, stretch your business across multiple platforms. Never rely on one uh, person or one business or one area to supplement uh, your entire business in, in terms of leads. So you're listening to That Business Show 2.0 with your host, Jamie Maloney, where real estate becomes show business. Hi, welcome to Yeagers. We just want to take a minute and show you what we're all about. Uh, at Yeagers, our primary business is hardwood flooring, although we are remodelers for kitchen, bath, and general construction. We operate a fleet of shop-at-home vans that have all the flooring-type products, hardwood flooring, laminate flooring, tile, stone, what have you. So we're able to come out first with products in our vehicles and take a look at the setting, how the colors will work, and then to be able to come up with some options and ideas for you. If that's not good enough, we have a large distribution center that we inventory product and have a nice display area.
Welcome back to the Real Estate Edition of That Business Show 2.0 with your host, Jamie Mooney, where real estate becomes a show business. Check out the uh, new site over at thatbusinessnetwork.com. On there, we've got uh, a lot of features that continue to uh, be added to the site. And also the uh, real estate uh, section along the uh, menu bar allows you to watch all the uh, past episodes uh, via both uh, audio and video on the site and search for area real estate uh, listings. Also get a free home valuation on the uh, site or go to that home valuation dot com and I'll direct you over uh, to uh, that page on the uh, website anywhere you're at in the uh, country we can help you buying or selling real estate and so you can reach out to me through that site you can also get me through the contact form on that site and see more about the uh, real estate side of my business at jamiemaloney.com uh, and again new episodes of this program air Thursdays at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time We've made it a separate podcast on iTunes. So if you're finding just the real estate edition of the program, there is the weekday version of the program in which we talk with many different entrepreneurs, business professionals, and community leaders about their business and what it is that makes them successful. So check out That Business Show 2.0 if you're finding us on iTunes under That Business Show 2.0, the real estate edition podcast. If you're a business professional and have been listening to the program for some time, and would like to come onto the uh, program, or if you're a real estate agent and would like to make an appearance on the real estate agent, I mean, the real estate edition, we will consider that as well. Go to tbsinterview.com for more information on how to come onto this program. A great video marketing uh, solution to get your brand and your uh, business out in front of the uh, public. A full 30 minute interview in high definition, complete with an MP3 and an MP4 track. Posted on iTunes, posted on YouTube, SoundCloud, and a variety of other podcasting platforms, all for just a small fee and will be far cheaper than any other video marketing uh, provider out there in uh, the uh, community for what you can get by doing a simple interview here on That Business Show and getting exposed uh, to easily uh, three to 5,000 listeners and viewers per show. So again, tbsinterview.com for more information. To date, we've had over 1,200 different people on this program, have conducted over 15, 1,600 different interviews. Sometimes we have some guests that return to the program, but all together, some 1,200 plus different people that have appeared on this program. And this project being an aside project from my primary business, which is real estate, which is what I talk about on Thursdays, hence the real estate edition of the uh, program. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the uh, Tampa Bay uh, real estate uh, market. Uh, In that last last episode uh, last week, I was talking about the the market correction uh, that is on the horizon that is going to uh, begin to depress values and and increase inventory. And, And it's a little bit foreboding, but we need inventory. And so I'm kind of excited to see an increase in inventory. Right now, it's it's just, it's brutal out there to find any properties uh, for anybody. Uh, and it's just, there's just no inventory out there. And so what, what has happened? I've been in, in real estate now for 10, 11 years or so now, and I've never seen a normal real estate market cycle. I came into 2000 and uh, seven and began to do uh, foreclosed properties. The financial crisis hit, uh, the, the robo signing mess hit, Dodd-Frank came into play. Then the real estate investment uh, groups came into the market in 2012. And then we had this election cycle this past year that uh, created all this uncertainty into the marketplace. And I've just never seen a normal real estate market. And in the last 10 years, uh, nobody really has seen a normal real estate market either. Is there really ever a normal real estate market? That's debatable. Uh, six months of inventory is, uh, is kind of the standard for what should normally be coming on and, and off the market. Uh, homes should stay on the market two to three months, but you know my p- a position on homes is staying on the market. I, I believe homes should come on and off the market within two to three weeks uh, if they are priced properly, but everybody likes to test the market and go to two to three uh, months. And, uh, standard listing agreements even go out uh, six months. Uh, and if it's taken six months, to sell your home, you've got a really weak uh, real estate agent or you've got your home poorly uh, positioned in terms in terms of price. Uh, next couple of years is going to be interesting, uh, though, to see what happens. The uh, investment groups that came into the uh, real estate market are currently kind of the, uh, the hinge pin on what's going to happen in Tampa Bay uh, specifically. They came in, they picked up a lot of properties in 2012, thousands of different properties. And I can remember buying for uh, one of the uh, for one of the brands. And uh, I was one of the first people in on the uh, ground floor. They thought foreclosures were what they were really after. And really even at, in 2012, foreclosures were about, you know, nine or 10% of the market versus like 1% of the market now. 
but they ended up uh, eating up more of the short sales that were on the uh, on the market than anything else. But they went after the foreclosure brokers first, and so I remember meeting with a representative of one of the funds that had been uh, spun off of uh, one of the uh, leaders out of uh, Goldman Sachs who had left the uh, company. It was like the third in command at Goldman Sachs. So you can see what type of opportunity this person saw to leave uh, that position in uh, Goldman Sachs in, in 2012 to start his own real estate investment uh, fund uh, to uh, purchase real estate, rent it out, and provide a return for you know investors and, and, of course, for himself. But they said they had an eight-year plan at that time. They came to me with their financial models, and they were basing uh, their their the requirement off of a cap rate, which is what you know most investors are looking at. What type of return can you get? And they they wanted that five percent cap rate, which is still kind of standard for investors uh, for the hedge funds uh, in Tampa Bay. It's it's difficult to hit five percent in in Tampa Bay right now because of all the the extra costs associated with real estate, the, the higher insurance rates, especially. In, in Hillsborough County, uh, you got your CDDs and then your HOA fees and your condo fees. All of those um, uh, it, it added on to the uh, cost of the uh, the property really make it difficult to hit uh, 5% with the values that we, we currently have. In 2012, for the first six months, it was fairly easily fairly easy because all the properties that were uh, short sold were priced below fair market value just to get anybody to make an offer on them. And so when they began to offer on these properties, about three or four other major funds immediately followed suit. It's interesting how the markets kind of shift all together. It's just, it goes back to this whole follower mentality that people were waiting for somebody to make that first move and everybody, everybody jumps in. The same thing happened uh, with the investment groups. When you know one person or one group made the move, whether it was the fund that I worked for, whether it was Blackstone, whether it was one of the other uh, uh, properties, uh, funds that came into the marketplace. I don't. I'm not really certain. All I know is it went from you know a slow, stagnant market, over uh, oversupplied, with a lot of people in a distressed situation, to being a very uh, lucrative market for uh, agents that were now representing these investment groups. These investment groups then went on to purchase thousands and thousands of assets. They're still buying uh, today, and new ones even still come into the. Uh, into the market uh, today. I was recently uh, working with one of them, but like I said, it's very difficult to find anything that, you know, that works at that 5% cap. And when they do hit that 5% cap, it's usually because they are underpriced and the property is going to get multiple offers. And so they weren't very competitive uh, with a requirement of a 5% uh, return. The eight year plan though, is what I wanted to kind of come back to. In 2012, they said eight years is the, uh, is, uh, is our window here. And so they believe that at that time, the values were at all time lows and they are correct. Uh, we've not seen uh, inventory, or we've not seen values uh, peak below those uh, 2012 uh, levels uh, that were set on, the, uh, set on the bottom end and rents were at peak levels and rents are beginning to stagnate now. But at that time uh, and over the last couple of years, they really have been at extraordinary rates. And it's incredible uh, to see some of the rents that people are paying versus what they could mortgage the property for. Before you go into a rent uh, a rental property today, talk with a loan officer uh, about what you can do uh, because the people are paying five, $600 a month over and beyond what they could mortgage the property for with no ownership rights, just a simple uh, uh, lease that guarantees them, you know, uh, 12 months or month to month in the, in the property, whatever it is that they are doing. Talk to a loan officer about buying a, a property. I've got plenty of great uh, contacts, uh, Frank Cotto, who is in a regular uh, on this uh, program before, 813 Mortgage, pick up the phone, give him a call, you drop the E, he drops the fee, that's his tagline, the 813 Mortgage. And so Frank Cotto over at the Lincoln Lending Group can uh, help you out. But in the next couple of years, so 2012, now it's 2017, so we're about five years into this, coming up on six years. Uh, the next couple of years, we're going to see them begin to release this inventory and get out of this market altogether and go dump their money into uh, into other things. Maybe we're already starting to see it happen. Maybe that's why the Dow is up over 21,000 points now. The stocks and bonds tend to run inverse to real estate. In 2001, when the, 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 the World Trade Center uh, tower or the trade towers were hit, 
uh, everybody fled the stock market. And that is what began the run up in real estate values because people started taking their money out of stocks and bonds and putting it into real estate. And from 2001 to 2005, 2006, we saw a steep, steady climb in real estate values. And again, that was all set off uh, a few other factors with regard to deregulation also. But uh, also the, uh, because you remember in 2001, after that, the Dow went down to 6,000 points at that one point. Uh, you imagine putting your money into the Dow at that point and it's now 21,000. That's a, what, a three and a half time uh, in, you know, increase in, in value since 2001. So right now we're starting to see a lot of money going into, uh, into the Dow, back into the stocks and bonds. Is it coming out of housing and going into the stocks and bonds? I don't know. Economics uh, analysts uh, can answer that question better than me and I'm not seeing any uh, articles or analysis uh, to, to that degree just yet. Real estate historically is a 17-year cycle if you, if you uh, talk with analysts from, from peak to peak. And so our peak in 2006, if you add 17 to that, that gives you a 2023 would have been the next peak, And so you, which means peak. Now, it doesn't mean the values then begin to increase. That means from peak to peak. So we're already starting to see that upward <coughs> upward climb, and we should see this over the next uh, uh, couple of years, but I think we're going to see, you know, not quite 17 years from peak to peak. It's probably going to be more in this situation, like uh, 11 or 12 uh, from uh, from peak to peak, and that has to do with, uh, you know, undue influences into the market, uh, such as the, uh, the abnormal amount of investment from hedge funds, which was unprecedented in, in recent uh, market cycles and all of a uh, result of the financial crisis that occurred in 2008. So what does all this mean? It means right now, if you're looking to sell your home in the next one to two years, sell it now. Don't wait down the road for a few more years because uh, the market will not be as good. It'll be a softening market and it'll be a much more of a buyer's market. Today is a seller's market. And if you're looking to get out of your home, now is the time to do it. So pick up the phone and give me a call, 813-760-8516. 813-760-8516. Use thathomevaluation.com also to get in touch with me and also jamiemaloney.com for more information on this program. New episodes of the Real Estate Edition air each uh, Thursday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time at thatbusinessnetwork.com. And you can find us on iTunes and on YouTube with all shows available on demand. Also on thatbusinessnetwork.com. Please, if you'd like to come onto the program too, visit tbsinterview.com for more information. Subscribe to us across uh, the social media uh, channels too. Find us at facebook.com forward slash that business show. Also the real estate page, facebook.com forward slash Tampa Bay REO. And also on Twitter at that biz show again, at that biz show. So you've been listening to the real estate edition of that business show 2.0. I'm your host, Jamie Maloney, where real estate becomes show business.